the topic of uh, this talk, as you can see on this slide, is about diaspora externalities, which is something I've been working on for uh, in the last three, four years. Um, and uh, Finn asked me to, to try to focus wherever possible on South-South migration. So you could have diasporas anywhere. Uh, it's a conference on development, so we're interested in all of these. Uh, lecture is about migration and development, the, the effect of diasporas and migration on the development of developing countries. And where possible, uh, I will try to, to emphasize what is specific, if anything, uh, about South-South migration in this uh, relationship. Uh, unfortunately, as you know, the data constraints prevent from, sometimes, from, from having this specific look, but wherever possible, I will, I will try to have it. Um, so it's an overview, it's not a research paper, it's an, an overview of uh, recent research with uh, an over-representation of my own work, I think would be a, a, the right qualification for, for this uh, lecture. So let me first uh, explain the, the title, the diaspora externality. Why do, do I call it this way? Because as we know, as economists, uh, externalities are kind of unintended consequences, or at least consequences on others' well-being when someone makes a decision, a consumption decision, a production decision, a migration decision, uh, this is based on cost and benefit analysis for that person on good and for the, the, the loved ones and the family and so on. But there may be also consequences of others which are not mediated through the market. In this case, economists call this an externality and I think this really what diasporas are about for home countries. These people make decisions to move not considering whether this is good or bad for the country, but uh, once they do move uh, and they form these diaspora networks, these migration networks, they can affect the home country in many ways, which are uh, externalities. Okay, so I will review uh, the different type of externalities. Um, migration externalities can be good or bad as any externalities, and uh, for example, the we have examples of negative migration externalities in the literature. For example, uh, there is a big literature in political science emphasizing that diasporas often take part in fuel civil, civil conflict. That would be a negative externality. Uh, in economics, the Dutch disease effect of remittances has been studied and it's a negative externality and maybe the most famous one is the brain drain externality. People leave, but by doing so, the stock of human capital in the home country uh, is depleted and that is bad for anyone left. We also have examples of positive externalities. You can uh, flip the brain drain story into a brain gain story if you, you factor in the incentives to educate, then the brain drain becomes a, a brain gain. That's a, in that case, that's a positive externality. But I think the most relevant uh, externalities are linked to, to the, the role of diaspora and migration networks. So what I will uh, split the presentation into uh, the contribution, in my view, of diasporas into favoring the economic integration of the home country into the global economy. So that will be part one on diasporas and integration, economic integration to, to the global economy, uh, which has been studied for quite some time, but I think there is new uh, interesting uh, pieces of uh, evidence. But also, a um, more recent uh, dimension, I think, is the cultural dimension. And I will uh, try to argue that diaspora networks can also uh, affect the cultural integration in a very broad sense. And I'll try to be more precise when I get here. Um, so the focus on the talk, as I said, will be on development. Uh, I will try to focus where, wherever possible on south-south migration. Uh, it's not always possible, as I said, because of data constraints. And also, the, I'm an economist, so I will uh, overrepresent economics literature uh, and, and my own work in, in, as part of it. Okay, so the roadmap for, for the talk is, as I said, two, two parts. The economic dimensions of globalization and the cultural dimensions of globalization. Okay, so for the economic dimension, quite traditionally, I will start with trade. I will move to FDI and other financial flows. And 
and then move to knowledge and technology uh, diffusion. I think diasporas play a very instrumental role here in favoring uh, these other dimensions of globalization. So it's not just migration is part of globalization, but it also uh, uh, works as something which is increasing the, the, the connection to the world through other dimensions of globalization, like trade, uh, investment flows, and knowledge. And then I will move to uh, culture, emphasizing mostly the political dimension of, of culture, what is called political remittances, uh, preferences for democracy, voting, and these type of things, how, how are they affected by migration. I will then move to fertility and other dimensions, other aspects of uh, what anthropologists have called social remittances. And then I will move to uh, uh, an exercise uh, which is asking whether migration makes home and host country culturally closer or more different, okay? And then conclude. So let me start with <coughs> economic integration, diasporas and the global economy, and uh, quite naturally with trade. It has been known for quite some time that there is what economists call the trade creating effect of migration. It's not that obvious when you think in uh, and that the standard neoclassical framework, migration and trade are seen as substitutes. Either you move goods or you move people, but if you won't move one of them, you need not to move the, the other one, so they tend to be substitutes. In reality, uh, we see this is not the case, that when you have more migrants moving from country A to country B, you also have more trade from country, between country A and country B. And the reason is, uh, two effects or two channels for this effect. One is information. Uh, trade is not free, is not, uh, trade is costly. You have transaction cost, and the fact that you have migrants between the two countries reduce this transaction cost and therefore favor uh, trade. Uh, you also have a preference effect, but the, the, the economists are more interested in, in the information effect, okay? The, the networks, in, in, in a sense of seeing migrants have, are as vectors of information, uh, allowing to reduce transaction costs across countries and the, therefore favoring trade. And the evidence uh, for this uh, information effect uh, is, is quite large. This started by, uh, with work, uh, again, in economics. Uh, I, I know there's been earlier, more qualitative uh, studies uh, outside of economics, but for economics it started with a work by Jim uh, Rauch, uh, studying ethnic Chinese networks and showing that when you have Chinese diasporas, uh, this is improving trade mostly between countries with a Chinese diaspora. So not between China and the countries where the Chinese are, but say between Thailand and the, uh, and the US, because you have Chinese in both countries, okay? Uh, and the argument was that it, they, they, they reduce information asymmetry, they improve trust, uh, and this is uh, evidenced by the fact that this beneficial effect of migration shows up only for trade in heterogeneous goods, which are goods for which there is an information problem, but not in trade for homogeneous goods such as commodities. Okay? So that was the initial uh, work. Uh, then there has been uh, also uh, a work looking at different countries vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, in, for the US, for Canada, uh, or cross-country studies showing consistently that when you have a bigger migration stock um, from country A to country B, this is good for exports from country B to country A. Okay, so this has been shown, as I said, in, in case studies, bilateral between US or Canada on the one hand and the rest of the world, or in a fully cross-country uh, bilateral setting. However, to quote uh, Gordon Hansen, these studies are not fully satisfying for economists who are obsessed with endogeneity, with uh, the direction of causality, with omitted variable explaining uh, the joint evolution of trade and migration. And so, uh, to, to quote uh, Gordon and so it is difficult to draw causal inferences from these uh, results since immigration may be correlated with unobserved factors that affect trade, such as trading partner, cultural similarity, or bilateral economic policies. 
Okay, so uh, what we are really after is uh, something more experimental, so we cannot uh, artificially create experiments, so we, we use experiments uh, pro provided by history, and that's called natural experiments. Ideally, we would like an experiment where uh, you take immigrants from one country, unexpectedly, you throw them uh, into that country, and you distribute them uh, spatially in a way which is exogenous in the sense that it is independent from the future trade potential with their home country. Uh, you forbid trade for some time, and 20 years later, you uh, open the relationship for trade, and you see what happens, and you check whether the places that happen to receive a bigger batch of uh, people uh, turn out uh, trading more with their origin country. Okay, so if you try to think of an experiment like that, uh, and we, we ask uh, God to carefully design such an experiment, he did that for us. Um, and uh, that's a paper by uh, uh, Chris Parsons and, and uh, Pierre-Louis Vezina, which is forthcoming in uh, Economic Journal. Uh, and I'm a big fan of this paper, so I'm uh, uh, advertising it. And it's called Migrant Networks and Trade the Vietnamese Boat People as a Natural Experiment. Uh, this is exploiting the inflow of Vietnamese uh, boat people to the US after uh, the end of the Vietnam War in the late 70s uh, on, uh, on trade with uh, Vietnam after the trade embargo was lifted in the mid-90s, so really 20 years later. So this graph tells you all about the, the paper. Um, yeah, the pointer is, is working. So you see here the inflow of Vietnamese immigrants to, to the US. You see the two first spikes are really the, the, the first refugee wave, those who left right after the fall of Saigon in 75, and those who really took on the boats in 79 during the Vietnam-China War. Um, and, and, and these are the numbers that came to the US. Okay? And, and afterwards, in the late 80s and early 90s, you also have another uh, second wave of, of people, and also the, the early wave could move after some time. So what they do is to take these, these guys as an instrument for the size of the migration networks of Vietnamese in different US states 20 years later, okay? And it's a very good predictor, and these guys were allocated exogenously because there was a special government program to do this in this way, and also because this was, these people were sponsored by US families, uh, which are uh, scattered in the US somehow exogenously, independently of future trade potential with Vietnam. Okay, and here you have trade uh, with Vietnam. I it's zero until 90 f uh, the early 90s. Uh, actually, the, there was a trade embargo on Vietnam uh, until 94, I think. And after 94, you see that the trade is picking up. Okay, so what they do is to ask whether states, U.S. states that received more refugees, Vietnamese refugees in the late 70s, happened to trade more with uh, Vietnam 20 years later. Okay, and, and indeed, this is uh, what they find, and this is uh, the, the result of the, of the regression and you see a positive slope, and then the slope is the elasticity of trade to migration, and is about 15%, okay? Which is slightly higher than the non-experimental studies I mentioned before, which got an elasticity of around 10%. So if you have 10% more uh, immigrants, you have 1% more exports, okay? So, uh, and you see the, these, um, the table with uh, this regression, and this is the IV, so using the stock of migrants predicted by the early distribution of refugees, okay? Uh, and the result is interesting. You see at the extensive margin and the uh, intensive uh, margin, so, and they do also interesting placebo tests and so on, so I, I, I cannot do, uh, it's not a presentation about their paper, but just to say that I see it as the, uh, the best paper in my view on, on this topic, okay? Let me move to another economic dimension, uh, which is uh, FDI and other financial flows. Uh, you've seen this picture maybe 20 or 50 times. It's about the rise of FDI 
from OECD to developing countries. The interesting thing is that it's not going everywhere. It's going mostly to uh, one of the two is Asia and the other one is Latin America, while Africa uh, is uh, the, the blue one here, not much picking up uh, FDI. And this is the Middle East, not picking up FDI from the OECD countries either. OK, so globalization is about the flow of investment. What are the connections with the flow of people? We can use the same information argument. Migrants from country A to country B improve information, lower transaction cost. They tell investors they sh about the, the, the first they speak the language, so they could connect people. They have business connections. They have political connections, which, as uh, you, we, we know, or can be useful for uh, FDI. They can uh, find par partners and so on. So they reduce information, and that should, uh, if we believe the main take from uh, this financial literature about the home bias, which is caused by a lack of information, if you reduce this lack of information, you should see more diversification of investment and, and of portfolio. Okay? And so this is what the, the literature is, is looking at. Uh, there is some micro literature, for, for example, this paper by Foley and Kerr in Management Science, uh, showing that uh, U.S. firms that have foreign inventors uh, signed on their patents uh, invest more in the home country of those in inventors. Okay, so that's micro firm level connection, and it's uh, it's nice to see it. There are also cross country. Uh, studies. So I did a study 10 years ago with uh, Maurice Kugler, uh, published in a small thing in uh, Economics Letters, in JDE, uh, Beata Javorsik and co-authors have about the same result that it's a bilateral exercise between the US and the rest of the world in both cases, showing that uh, when you have a bigger stock of immigrants from a given country to the US, uh, that increases FDI from US firms to to the home uh, country of migrants. It's not the case everywhere. It's the case uh, mostly uh, in, in the service uh, sector and in, in sophisticated manufacturing sectors. Okay, so there is this dynamic complementarity, if you want, between migration and FDI. And in a recent uh, paper, we're not yet finished, although we've been working on it for quite some time with uh, Aubry and, and Reshef, what we do is to try to connect trade and FDI using uh, uh, the Melitz framework where you have heterogeneous firms and these firms try, uh, are choosing the mode of entry to the foreign market. So if you want to sell on the foreign market, you can do it either through trade by exporting or by investing through FDI in that uh, foreign market. Which means that there is uh, a connection uh, that you should look at trade and FDI not separately as the rest of the literature which I presented uh, has done, but jointly. So what we do is to develop a, a theoretical model based on this uh, Melitz framework, but I think the intuition uh, is clear from this graph. This is a measure of productivity. So you have very productive firms here, and this is the distribution of firms. So you have a lot of uh, firms with low productivity and very few firms with high productivity because the fixed cost of doing FDI are very high. Only the most productive firms will do FDI. The fixed cost of doing exports are a bit lower, so firms with intermediate level of productivity uh, will do exports and firms with relatively low levels of productivity will not sell on the foreign market but will stay on the domestic market. Okay, so assume this is the threshold to do FDI, so only the firms in this, uh, the density of firms uh, will be here, okay? And to do exports, uh, this is the threshold, so on, only the firms uh, here, sorry, here, this is the, the threshold for export, so these firms will do exports, okay? Now assume you have something in our story migration which reduces the fixed cost of doing both FDI and trade, so this threshold will be lowered, uh, the threshold for doing FDI will move from here to here. The threshold to do exports will go from here to here. Okay, and we ask, how will this affect FDI? You will have more firms doing FDI, not just the firms between these, uh, sorry, here, but also the firms between the two thresholds. 
and you have uh, more firms doing exports. But as you can see, those who start doing FDI do it uh, at the expenses of exports. Okay, so our prediction from the model under uh, some uh, parameter restrictions is that when you have more migration, you should see an increase in the ratio of FDI to trade, okay, which is uh, the, the outcome we are looking at, the ratio of FDI to trade. So when you look at trade and FDI separately, uh, as the rest of the literature, uh, you, you see uh, these positive effects. Uh, on, on trade for the first two columns and on FDI for the other ones, uh, with elasticity of, of about 15, 10% consistently with the rest of the literature for trade and around 20% for FDI. But when you look at the ratio, uh, which is also good to do because you're accounting for, for many things which you, you should account for, um, then you see something around 10%, meaning that when you have more migration, you increase FDI by 10% more than you do for exports, okay? Which is uh, confirming our theoretical prediction. Now, FDI is not the only type of financial inflow to developing countries we want to look at. We, uh, as you see from this, as you see from this graph, uh, FDI is in orange. It's important, but it's not the only financial inflow to developing countries. You see that other financial flows, such are such mostly the other financial financial flows are mostly bank loans, all right, and the portfolio flows, the purchase of equity uh, and bonds, uh, are also not. Uh, negligible, all right? So what is the evidence on migration and the flow of other financial flows to the home country? Okay, if you have people from Ghana uh, going to France, uh, will that increase the likelihood that the French bank will lend money to a Ghanaian company? Okay, that's the type of question we, we are asking. Or that uh, financial investors in France will uh, buy more equities from Ghanaian firms as part of their portfolio, all right? And we find such, uh, such an effect in a paper which is uh, uh, with Kugler and Levinthal, like forthcoming at World Bank Economic Review. Okay, I, will s I have to speed up a bit, I guess, so I will spare you the, the regressions. Uh, what we do is to look at the direct effect, but mostly at second order effects. We, we, we say if this is a problem of, of information, <coughs> this positive effect that we find should be stronger when we look at skilled migrants versus un unskilled migrants. Should be stronger when we look at long-term loans, which have a strong risk in uncertainty information component and not so much at short-term loans when we look at countries which are culturally very distant because this is where migrants can help and not so much for countries uh, which are linguistically or culturally closer, etc. And we f consistently find all these uh, heterogeneous effects which tell a plausible story every time in the same direction, suggesting that information is indeed <coughs> uh, something uh, behind the channel uh, behind this uh, this result, uh, it's for now that the data I presented is only OECD to developing countries, so it's only north south. Still, when you look at uh, you interact the effect of migration with the fact that the home country of migrants is a developing country, um, and and not just any country, uh, you see a stronger effect manifesting itself when we do the, the Poisson estimator, which is indicative of the fact that the effect works mostly at the extensive margin, and the fact that uh, French bank will start lending to Ghanaian companies and, and not that they will lend more, all right? So it's really the extensive mar margin that seems to matter for developing countries. And the last aspect of the economic uh, integration uh, I want to, to talk about is about knowledge and technology diffusion. And I think this is the new, really, topic. Uh, trade, FDI, have been studied for quite some time. There are improvements, refinements, it's, it's nice, but I think that innovation and technology uh, is really the, the most uh, frontier, I would say, uh, dimension of this, uh, of this uh, 
connection. <laughs> so let me start by um, by saying that it, uh, uh, something well known for people who, who study knowledge diffusion, innovation, is the fact that knowledge diffuses uh, in concentric circles, okay? Very easily when you're close to an innovator, and then when you're far from the, the place where the innovation has been invented, uh, then it's difficult for knowledge to, to circulate, okay? Even with internet and so on. Okay, and the, f the reason which has been, uh, first this has been very well documented. Before being documented, this was conjectured by people like uh, Cal Polanyi or Kenneth Arrow, uh, who argued that uh, uh, knowledge can be separated into what is a codified knowledge and what is tacit knowledge. And tacit knowledge requires direct human interaction to be transmitted, okay? So building on this uh, insight that if a good chunk of knowledge is tacit, meaning it needs direct human interaction to be diffused, our uh, hypothesis was that then the international diffusion of knowledge should follow the international movement of people, migration, okay? And this is what we wanted to, uh, to check uh, mostly with Dani Bahar, uh, co-author of mine, we, we have uh, this paper where we ask, um, so first thing that the, the main measure of knowledge diffusion which has been used so far is pattern citations, okay? So you follow how knowledge diffuses by following uh, where the, the patent is cited, okay? We chose another, another route. The, our measure of innovation uh, in connection with the work by uh, Ricardo Osman and, and others uh, at Harvard CID uh, is to say, well, if you look at the basket of exports of a country and that basket is changing over time, so you start exporting goods that you did not export before, then you, your productivity must have uh, risen if you start exporting something, um, and meaning that you, you must have learned something in, in the process, okay? So, uh, what we do is to look how migration affects the evolution of the export basket of countries. So we have two papers, one which is a full cross-country exercise, uh, forthcoming at the Economic Journal, uh, where we ask, say, I'll take the, the example of Ghana, uh, if I see that the result will be that if Ghana wants to start exporting beer, I know that Ghana is producing beer because I had two yesterday, one and a half. I don't know if they are exporting beer. Um, to ex export beer, maybe Ghana needs a productivity and quality shift, okay? And one way to get this would be, in our story, to have migrants coming from Germany or to have Ghanaians emigrating to Germany. And after some time, knowledge will diffuse, okay, through these human interactions. So in that fully cross-country uh, paper, all we knew was whether Ghana has emigrants in Germany or whether the immigrants to Ghana come from Germany, but we don't know where they work, okay? In a second exercise that the second paper, we, we zoomed on Germany because for Germany we have access to the, uh, labor, uh, to the labor survey, which tells us where immigrants, in which industry immigrants work. So now we can ask whether having Ghanaian immigrants in Germany actually helps Ghana start exporting cars or beers or goods for which Germany is good at, okay? So these are the, the papers uh, we, we are doing building on this insight that migrants are carriers of knowledge, of tacit knowledge that they can transmit. Um, Danny likes this picture of Hanshuk Valley in South Africa, so he put it on the presentation uh, for the, our paper one, two years ago when we started presenting it. So the reason it's here is that Hanshuk Valley means the French corner in Afrikaans. It's a valley near Cape Town where the French Huguenots that were expelled uh, from France at the end of the uh, 17th century. 
uh, established themselves and uh, uh, they were good at making wines coming from France and that's where the wine, South African wine industry started. Okay? <coughs> so because I'm a ver very de dedicated researcher, I decided to do field work and for this talk I went to Franchou last week uh, and the field work was to do wine tasting. <laughs> and I confirmed the uh, South African wine are, are very good. Um, but I wanted another, one product is not enough. So I tasted beer also. And uh, I asked uh, in a beer uh, bar, give me your best two beers. And South Africa is a producer of beer, but you see these ones come from Namibia, uh, which was a German colony. So they, do, they know how to do uh, proper beer, unlike the Dutch and the British. Sorry for those in the room. Uh, and indeed, Namibia is, um, by its standards, a bigger, much bigger exporter, size adjusted, of beer than, than South Africa. So the story is about uh, uh, this slide having, uh, so now it's about the US and Italy. If you have Italians coming to the US, uh, the US will become good at making pizzas, but also Italy will become good at making hamburgers. Okay, so that's the story that uh, once you check the, the data, you consistently find uh, this uh, result. Uh, we'll spare you the details of the empirical strategy, but we exclude bilateral trade, so that it's not uh, uh, network effect as in the first part of the presentation that we capture. We control for uh, global demand for the goods, so it's not just picking up possible connections between migration waves and demand for certain goods. We are instrumenting properly, doing a gravity model and so on. So we, we're uh, reasonably confident uh, that our result is, is not an artifact of something else. Uh, and it works at the extensive margin. This is for both immigrants and emig immigrants, okay? So again, really the story is not just Germans coming to Ghana, but also Ghanaians going to Germany at the export, at the intensive mar extensive margin and at the intensive margin, okay? So the growth of export is also positively affected if you already exported the goods, uh, the growth of exports will be significantly affected. So this is also, um, uh, you have much stronger effects for skilled migrants than for unskilled migrants. I think this is consistent with a knowledge diffusion uh, story. And here we were uh, able to uh, focus on South-South migration, okay, because we have really global trade data and global migration data. And I think this is a very interesting and important message that this is not just a story about North-South migration, but this knowledge circulation works for South-South migration. The point estimate is slightly lower, but it's, it's not that uh, lower, and, uh, and, and it's robust, okay? Uh, mostly for immigrants, but al also for, no, it's, it's it, yeah, you have 10% significance for one of the regressions, okay? Uh, so I think it's an important message to convey that if you want to diversify your uh, export basket, and this is a concern for many developing countries, migration both in and out, including to other developing countries, is, is one way to go. Okay, that, we'll come back to that uh, when I wrap up with policy conclusions. Uh, and that works uh, for south-south migration, both at the extensive and intensive margin, again. Okay, we have another paper I will uh, maybe not talk about, just that zooming uh, on Germany, because now we know where migrants uh, work in which industry and we find, let's say, the same result. This is for immigrants from anywhere in the world to Germany. Okay, and we, the channel here could be just having migrants present, could be return migration, and we, we focus even more looking at Yugoslavian refugees that came to Germany in the 90s and went back uh, after a few years. Okay, M maybe the only, yeah. Okay, let, let me 
just for that uh, Germany paper, we, we can look not just as, at skilled and unskilled migrants, but also uh, because this uh, German labor force survey is quite detailed, we also know whether people, uh, not just whether they are skilled or unskilled, but also whether they are uh, white collars or non-white collars, whether they work in, in occupations with high analytical and cognitive content or in manual tasks, and uh, whether uh, their jobs are classified as a high problem solving or low pro problem solving jobs. And you see that time and again, consistently, the results are stronger for type of occupations that are skilled. Okay, so it's, a, it's consistent again with a knowledge diffusion uh, story. Okay, let me move now to the second part, the, the cultural uh, dimension now. Uh, here uh, I want to pay tribute to Peggy Levitt, uh, she's an anthropologist uh, at, um, I can't remember the name of the university near Boston, Brandeis, Brandeis University. Uh, and she is the one who coined the term social remittances and defined them as migrants' transfers of behavioral and cultural norms to their origin communities. So many of the things that economists do are already known by other social scientists. It's just that we are putting a number on it and we're maybe more precise about mechanism. That's uh, at least the, see, the way we, we see it. So there is, this is known for quite some time that you have tr cultural transmission of values, of preferences, of institutions uh, through migration. But can you show it uh, when you look at big numbers? Can you show it in a, in a case study where you have a careful identification strategy, this is what the economics literature uh, is about. So let me start with political remittances. Uh, the first uh, paper here, uh, looking at cross-country evidence, is a paper by uh, Antonio Spilimbergo in American Economic Review. Uh, his paper was about foreign uh, students and democracy, showing that countries that have a lot of foreign students in one time period, well, we'll have better democracy outcomes in the following period, okay, using uh, comparative indices of, of democracy and UNESCO data on, on, on foreign students. Uh, he also had a more uh, anecdotal exercise on where leaders uh, were educated, where, whether they were educated at Harvard or at the Sorbonne, for example. And that also seems to matter. Uh, but the, the take from his paper was that foreign students are good for democracy only if they studied in a democratic country. Okay, if they went to the Soviet Union, that didn't do any good to democracy in their home country. Okay, that was his paper. Uh, I think it's very nice because it was the first to, to, to tell the story. Uh, I think, though, the story is not specific to, or to foreign students. It could be generalized to any type of migrants. And this is what we did with uh, Dokielo Di Gianni and Schiff in a paper published last year in the Journal of Development Economics to look just at migrants in general. And we find, that, say, to, to make it short, the same uh, result that where, uh, you have, when you have migrants, I mean, openness to migration is good in terms of democracy. Um, we also have IVs and we, we think our result is stronger in the sense that his result was based on the fact that, uh, think of uh, he, his main uh, variable of interest was what he called uh, a democracy score at destination, a weighted average of the democracy score of where your immigrants go, okay? Uh, but the, the interaction with the number of immigrants didn't matter which is kind of difficult to, to interpret. Okay, in our uh, paper, we have both the result that where people go matters, but if more people go, that also matters, okay? Uh, however, again, this is cross-country uh, study. Even if you do the most sophisticated uh, instrumental variable strategy, uh, you will only half convince a sympathetic reviewer. Um, and so what you are really after 
is a nice natural experiment where you can really be more confident in terms of identification, even though the external validity may not be uh, certain. So in, th and there are a few uh, papers, there are papers on Mali, there are papers on Cap Verde, looking at immigration from those countries or, or, or out of Mexico. Uh, I see some problems with these uh, case studies in the sense that um, countries like Mali or Cap Verde had um, immigration that started very long time ago, okay? And so they could have affected the evolution of democracy in the country and, and you, you don't know exactly what, you, what you're picking up. So what you'd like, again, is a natural experiment where the experimental conditions to test the effect, the causal effect of migration on the evolution of prefer political preferences, votes, democracy, can be uh, trust. So we believe with uh, uh, these three co-authors in, in, in a paper which is on Moldova and published this year in the American Economic Journal, uh, that Moldova provides us such, a, such an exper natural experiment. Uh, so the paper is titled, The Effect of Labor Migration on the Diffusion of Democracy, Evidence from a Former Soviet Republic. So that former Soviet Republic is Moldova. And the reason why we uh, are interested in Moldova is that uh, it has the two features we think are uh, essential to, to empirically look at this relationship between immigration and democracy. First, condition building on the insight from Spielenberg, or you want to compare emigration to a non-democratic destination with emigration to a democratic destination, okay? And this is exactly what happened with Moldova uh, that has about 40% going west and 60% going east, mostly to Russia. And second, so this is to be uh, a bit earlier, and, and second, the timing is important. So the, 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 the context is that Moldova had no emigration before the Russian crisis of 98. Okay, it was specialized in agriculture. There were some minorities that uh, left Moldova uh, after independence, but for the rest, the country was, uh, had no, certainly no re migration to the West before the fall of, of uh, the Berlin Wall. And even until the late 90s had uh, virtually no migration to the West and very, very little migration to the rest of the Soviet Union. So Moldova was specialized in agriculture. It was hit much harder by the Soviet, uh, by the Russian crisis than Russia because it was so much dependent on agricultural export to Russia. So when the crisis hit, they had to find alternative sources of income and started emigrating quite massively. So uh, what you see here is that this migration to the west, each dot on this scatter plot is a community. We have something like 800 communities and uh, the outcome variable is the votes for the Communist Party in the elections of 2009. The Communist Party was still ruling Moldova in 2009. Okay, it was the last ruling party in, in Europe, Communist Party in Europe, and the 2009 election put an end to its rule. So you see here that migration to the West decreased the vote. I mean, these are simple correlations, okay? Maybe this is completely spurious, but there is a negative correlation between migration to the West and votes for the communists and a positive correlation between migration to the East and votes for the communists. Um, you would think this may be driven by self-selection on political preferences, but if you think another minute, it goes the other direction. If people who want democracy emigrate to the West, then the share of votes for the communists in their community should go up. Okay, because if they had not migrated, they would have voted against the communists. And conversely, if the people who want communism in sense of uh, Putin-style uh, uh, regime, go authoritarian regime, go to, to Russia, uh, they would have voted for the Communist Party, which is offering uh, the same uh, platform of nationalism and interventionism. Uh, and so the, the share of votes should go uh, down for the communists. So self-selection into migration on political attitudes is playing against us, is going the other direction. So what is the force? Uh, there must be a counteracting force and we believe this is this uh, political remittances. 
So this, is, this graph is, is a summary of, of the paper. You see that uh, we had elections just before the Russian crisis, and, this, and these were, uh, you see the share of votes for the communist here. So the black line is the average share of, of communist votes. The red one is uh, for communities which had strong emigration to Russia, and the blue one is uh, for communities which had uh, strong emigration to the EU. Okay, and, and interestingly you see that when you compare the, the, the two type of communities, they don't diverge until 2005. Okay, oh, so this is a differences in differences exercise. So we have this common trend assumption which is validated and so on, and they start diverging only uh, after 2005 for the last round of election, which is consistent with a story in terms of preference changing, building up, uh, transfer. It takes time to change, uh, and it takes time to make people around you uh, changing. Okay, so that's consistent, but we have a different sets of results looking at more precise uh, things that back support really uh, an interpretation in terms of preferences uh, changing. And this is uh, the same thing but in a table showing that the prevalence of emigration to the West is associated with a uh, negative effect on communist vote. The point estimation is interesting, it's 0 0.7, 0 0.6, meaning that if you have 1% more share of immigrants to the West, votes for the communists will decrease by 0.7, which is quite high. It's almost a one-to-one. -one. It's really high if you consider that this should compensate self-selection into migration on, on political views. So we see it actually as, as, as a lower bound estimate. Um, and we're controlling, obviously, for all the things you, you may want to think about. Uh, we control for pre-migration results, so it's a different, if it's a change in votes for the communists, okay, uh, on, on differential migration east or west. Uh, we control for uh, initial, the intensity of the economic shock of those different communities. Uh, and we control for demographic characteristics, ethnic composition, uh, geographic, a characteristic if you're close to the Romanian border, to the Ukrainian border, and so on. Okay, so that's for political preferences. Let me move to the other uh, domain of culture, which I think has, has been most studied, which is fertility. And, um, and this started by a paper by a demographer, Philippe Farg, comparing uh, Morocco and Egypt, he noticed that communities in Morocco who have a lot of migrants tend to have lower fertility than otherwise similar communities, while in Egypt, communities that have a lot of immigrants uh, tend to have higher than otherwise similar communities. And he conjectured that this could explain by the destination. Moroccans go to Western Europe, a low fertility region, while Egyptians go to the Gulf countries, uh, high fertility, more traditional uh, by uh, religious standards, for example, compared to, to Egypt. And so his conjecture was that there was some social remittances, what I call Malthusian remittances, uh, that you transfer a norm that small families are, uh, are fine, that gender roles should be more balanced, etc. things which are part of culture of Western Europe that are transmitted by migrants, by returning, by contacts, by phone calls, letters, whatever. And conversely for Egypt, that tend to become more traditional if you're exposed to the cultural influence uh, of the Gulf countries. So that was a conjecture, but this conjecture has received support in different studies, a cross-country study uh, in by Ben Dokian Schiff, or a careful examination of the case of Egypt by Bertoli and Marchetta. So here the case study I want to talk about is uh, a case study of, in economic history um, with uh, two co-authors who are economic historians, um, Guillaume Dodin and Raphael Franck. And we look at France. We look not at international migration, we look at internal migration in France. <coughs> 
And France is an interesting country if you are interested in, in uh, the fertility transition because it is the first country to have experienced the fertility transition one century before England. Okay, so the fertility transition started in France in the late uh, 18th century while it started only around 1880 uh, in England. And this is a puzzle, it's called the French fertility puzzle. How to explain this given that England was more advanced uh, economically, was more urbanized, industrialized and so on. Uh, so our conjecture is that uh, Contrarily to England and the rest of Europe, France was not an emigration country. The French did not emigrate, okay? They tried to in the 18th century, but their colonies were uh, uh, taken by England relatively quickly. They had only one settlement colony in Algeria, uh, but for the rest, they, they, they didn't move uh, overseas. They didn't go to the US or to the new countries, for, for example, com contrary to England, to Germany, Italy, and so on. But they moved internally a lot. And, and what we want to, to check is, because initially France, at the beginning of the 19th century, let's say, was not culturally integrated. You had regions of very high fertility and regions of very low fertility, mostly Paris. Uh, and whether this migration to the low fertility regions had any social remittance uh, effect, transmission, uh, same type of mechanism as I described. So for this, we do a big uh, data work, which is to build a matrix of uh, bilateral panel migration data between the different French regions, the département, and there are uh, about 100 such département for this uh, period of the late uh, 19th century. So from mid 19th century to beginning of the 20th century, you see here that uh, France, if you compare France to England, Italy, or Germany, you see that France was clearly on a declining trend already by the, the mid-19th century, while this started later everywhere else, most, and England started only after uh, 1870, 1880. Uh, and France was lower, okay? The point, is, uh, the, the point here is 0.3. Uh, while England was at close to 0.4, Italy was at 0.4, Germany was at 0.4. This is a type of fertility index you don't want to know about, but take it as a, a, uh, some measure of fertility, okay? Uh, the new countries were uh, high land to labor ratio and you needed to have uh, big families if you wanted uh, the optimal technology uh, you get land in the US, uh, you need big, you, it's a family farm, uh, you want seven, eight kids to, to do everything uh, properly, okay? Um, and so that, in terms of selection, it means that when you have international migration, those who want big families are the ones who will leave, okay? So those who stay should have lower family. That should decrease, through self-selection, the fertility of those who remain. Okay, uh, for France, it's internal, mostly rural to urban migration. It goes the opposite. Those who would leave the country to go to the city are those who don't want a family or want small families or so on, and that should increase fertility in the regions of origin. And we find exactly the opposite. Okay, so we, there must be something else going on, and this is what we are after. So you see here for France the evolution of migration here the evolution of fertility over the period, and we ask whether there is a causal a relationship between these two. Okay, more migration, less fertility. And we, um, we build our matrix and we use an instrument for migration which is based on the diffusion of the railroad, the railroad network, uh, which is exogenous to demand conditions because this is the French system, so you you, it's not market forces, it's the state who wanted to connect the different parts of France in, in, in uh, uh, it was designed by engineers and not by entrepreneurs, okay? Um, yeah, and what we find, uh, yeah, what we find is that migration explains, internal migration explains two-thirds 
uh, that sounds a lot, of the decrease of fertility and the convergence in fertility across regions for the period which study. And Paris itself explains uh, two thirds of the effect of migration, while it's only one quarter of the internal migration. So there is a very strong effect of migration. What we show is not just migration, but this, uh, what matters is whether you go, your migrants go to low fertility regions, okay, including Paris. And we see that the effect of Paris is totally disproportional, and this is consistent with a cultural diffusion uh, dimension because France was getting centralized. Politically, they wanted to diffuse the, the, the central culture out of Paris and, and so on. Okay, so again, this is, I think, going the same direction as the, the studies I presented before. Then there are other dimensions of soci soci societal change. Uh, there is this interesting paper on the Hajj, on the pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. So this is clearly South-South migration, showing uh, for Pakistanis, uh, if you want to go to, to do the pilgrimage, there are too much demand, there is a quota, so there is a lottery. Okay, so what they exploited it is to compare communities which happen to have uh, won a uh, lot of slots through the lottery to communities that didn't, okay? So you, but, but participated in the lottery, okay? So what they show is that those who went to uh, the pilgrimage, again, think of Pakistan as a very fundamentalist on a liberal to fundamentalist Islamic scale, and there in, in, the, in Mecca, you mix with Muslims coming from the rest of the world. On average, they will be more liberal okay, than, than a Pakistani. Okay? And they show that attitudes to tolerance, uh, uh, religious tolerance to women, uh, this type of thing to superstition are significantly uh, affected and decrease, uh, become more uh, moderate, if you want, uh, for those who mixed uh, with other Muslims uh, during this experience. So this is a kind of illustration of the fact that migrating is a transformative experience and that this transformative experience can then spill over to, to the rest, uh, to, to, through social networks. All right, so let me conclude with, I have fi five minutes, is okay? With the last dimension of culture, uh, which is really asking, well, what about migration and this cultural aspect of, of globalization? So what we ask here is essentially whether migration between two countries make them culturally more similar or more uh, distant. Uh, this question has already been asked for trade theoretically in this paper by Olivier, Tonig and Verdier, and both theoretically and empirically, uh, again with Tonig and Verdier and other co-authors. And essentially what they found here is that trade integration, when you have more trade between two countries, it leads to cultural convergence. The countries become more similar, maybe because you're consuming goods that uh, you're eating hamburgers, viewing American movies, so you become culturally closer to, to the US. Okay, that's kind of the point of, of the paper. So we wanted to ask whether, first, this is true for migration, but not just. Maybe uh, migration is a stronger driver of cultural convergence than trade. So what we do with two, two co-authors, uh, Soline Sardosho is a PhD student, Arthur Silva from Laval University, um, is to have both a theoretical model, which is based on, the, for those who know this, the Bizin-Verdier framework of cultural transmission, where you have, uh, say, horizontal transmission by being exposed to people. You pick a, a role model, if you want, but also vertical transmission through your parents, which can invest in transmitting their own cultural trait. Okay, so we have this model. Uh, and, and we have actually two models, a purely compositional model and a diffusion model, a cultural transmission model. And we compare the predictions of these two models. The forces, I will just sketch uh, the forces uh, that we, we capture in the theoretical model is the selection. Okay, so think that uh, you're in a country where some people like football, some people like baseball. And if you're in Ghana and you like baseball, maybe you want to move to the US to be surrounded by 
other baseball lovers because then you want your kids to love baseball as well and it's more likely that they will pick a baseball lover as role model if you are in the US than if you stay in Ghana. Okay, so that's the story of the selection. Uh, and that should create cultural divergence. Okay, because if baseball lovers in Ghana move to the US, then the two countries become more dissimilar. Okay, less baseball lovers in, 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 in Ghana and more in the US, so uh, the two populations become culturally more distant. The second effect is the diffusion. Uh, if Ghanaians move to the US, they can diffuse their, their love for football, or they can send, whoops, send to Ghana, sorry, I'm, I speak with hands, and so I should be careful with the microphone. Uh, they can send, the, the, if they are in the US, they may be more powerful at, at, sending, at sending preferences for baseball to Ghana. Uh, that's the, 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 the third one, the social uh, remittances. So we, in the model, we, 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 we kind of put these different forces together and compare two models, one based purely on, on composition through self-selection, and one uh, based on including the cultural transmission, or the forces that lead to cultural transmission. We compare the predictions of these models. Uh, one predicts divergence, the other one predicts convergence. That's clear. But we have interesting, uh, more refined predictions. What happens with when you have more economic gains, meaning more uh, wage differences between the two countries, a compositional model would predict convergence, uh, while the transmission model would predict divergence. If you increase now the initial cultural distance between the two countries, the compositional model will predict divergence, while the transmission model will predict uh, convergence. So we are not able with the data, which I will explain in a second, uh, to say, to decompose the effect. We find only the overall effect, but clearly, if divergence is obtains, then it means that the self-selection and the compositional dimensions dominate, while if convergence obtains, then it means that the diffusion uh, transmission uh, channels dominate. Okay, and this is what we do. Uh, we build different statistical measures of cultural similarity for robustness, not just use one, there are many in, in the literature. So the data comes from the World Value Survey, so a rich set of questions in a panel setting for many countries. Um, and the, the migration data is bilateral migration data by the World Bank. Uh, and the specification we test is whether the cultural similarity, CS, for cultural similarity between country I and J at time T, is affected by migration in the previous period, bilateral migration in the previous period, bilateral trade in the previous period, and, and, and we have a very rich fixed effect structure with country time, destination time, um, and most importantly, uh, uh, dyadic uh, fixed effect, okay? Country, country fixed effect. So let's look, and uh, so this is about cultural similarity. So if beta one for migration, beta two for trade is positive, this means migration or trade create more similarity, convergence, or if it's negative, it's less similarity, divergence, okay? And here, uh, what you see is that the, the effect of migration uh, is almost always positive and very significant except here for one specific measure. So, uh, uh, but the ones we really believe is the, the last column which includes also the bilateral fixed effect, okay? So if I focus on the last column uh, with the full set of fixed effect, you see that migration is creating more similarity uh, for the three uh, indicators, and it's uh, quite significant. Um, okay. Um, the, yeah, let me comment on trade. Uh, here you can see this as a horse race. Trade is no longer robust and significant once you include this uh, bilateral fixed effect, which was not included in the, the previous study I mentioned. Okay, while migration survives this uh, introduction. 
so for the second order uh, predictions, uh, the effect of income differences, we add GDP gap between the countries here, and you see that the bigger GDP gap uh, decreases similarity, which is consistent with the transmission model, but not with the compositional model uh, for all uh, indicators. And when you introduce initial uh, cultural uh, distance, you see that the interaction with initial uh, distance is negative as predicted by the, the transmission model, but against the compositional model. So in a nutshell, what we believe is that the true forces that uh, shape this uh, cultural distance between countries are forces of convergence through cultural diffusion and transmission and not from self-selection and composition. Here we were also able to focus on south-south migration. And uh, I think the result we get may be disappointing, but makes sense with the whole story. If it's about cultural transmission, that you would pick a role model that you're influenced by, uh, by, by others, so you see that north-north, nothing happens. Uh, South-north is exactly the result we get but south south nothing happens. So this story of cultural diffusion and convergence is really for north, uh, sorry, south-north migration, but not for north-north or south-south, okay? Uh, and again, it's consistent with a role model where you want to emulate, say, a successful person, and uh, for migrants who emigrate to rich countries, probably in poor countries that are seen as successful, candidate role models, while those who go to neighboring countries may not play such a, a role. But I'm speculating, but I think uh, this is consistent with the, the theoretical uh, argumentation. Okay, um, all right, so let me conclude uh, with two slides. One, migration is contributing to the economic integration of the home country into the world markets. Two, it's contributing to the cultural uh, integration uh, also uh, to the global culture and the global uh, economy. In terms of what did we learn, I think as I said that these things are not entirely new. It's not, wow, something very surprising, but I think it's good to have some confidence about the direction of causality and to be able to quantify uh, and put a number, how much is an elasticity. And this quantification, I think, is especially important if you want to convince policymakers uh, that they should consider diasporas and immigration seriously when thinking about development. So what are the pol policy implications? I think for home countries, there are uh, obvious, and, and many among you, I think, have, have been advocated for things that allow for people to move more freely, to keep dual citizenships, uh, and facilitate cross-border, uh, facilitate diaspora involvement in, in local uh, politics and policies, and so on. There is also a policy implication for receiving countries, which is that if by having migrants coming, you can reduce fertility in their home country, improve democracy, uh, and improve their integration into the global economy, which is exactly what development policy is about, maybe uh, migration is the right way to go rather than something else. Okay, and I will conclude here.